Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Karthik. Um, so Karthik is part of the Cambridge Mafia. Yay! Yay. Uh, so did a, an undergrad and a PhD in the engineering department. Um, and then I think went to BCG for, for a little bit. Yep. Uh, but then thought, you know what? Consulting is not really fun anymore. I'm a bit bored. Let's do a startup. Let's join a startup, and so Karthik is now at Fisher Space, which is one of the local success in Cambridge. They work on anomaly detection specifically for uh, bank transactions, and Karthik is the head of uh, data science there. So really looking forward to a presentation. Uh, <coughs> thank you. <coughs> so I guess, yeah, one of the things that Raul kind of missed out there a little bit is that I thought, oh, well, you know, Consulting wasn't a huge amount of fun, so I actually taught maths at a high school in London for a little while. So I taught, uh, uh, and then you know, uh, so yeah, maybe that that segues really that segues really well into uh, uh, an introduction to Feature Space. So obviously, so Feature Space is you know I guess uh, when I joined it was a startup, right? It was 25 people, and you know it was we were solving problems that you know, were big and, you know, we didn't really know what the right way forward was. Uh, I think, you know, we're probably more accurately described as a scale-up now. So at the start of the year, we were maybe about 80 people. I think we're about 150 now. Uh, and we're growing pretty rapidly, right? So uh, we're the world leaders in adaptive behavioral analytics. And we're the world leaders because we invented the term, right? So uh, there's not that many people competing with us. Uh, Having said that, though, I think, uh, you know, it started in, uh, it spun out of the engineering department, the signal processing department at, at Cambridge. Uh, the guy who taught me signal processing, Bill Fitzgerald, set Feature Space up with his PhD student. And actually, you know, like, uh, as Raul was saying, he said, oh, you know, look, uh, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm teaching now. He says, well, you know, do you want an adventure? I have a company. Why don't you come and join? It's like, oh, sounds like fun. Why not? And uh, three years and many, many other things later, uh, here we are. I think a lot of our customers, so you probably won't hear of Feature Space uh, because a lot of our customers are the major payment processors or banks, right? So we are kind of providing the back-end services, the back-end fraud prevention services for a lot of these kind of things. So, uh, you know, even though you probably won't hear of us, our systems will probably process your transactions, right? So uh, that's where we are. So banking fraud, right? So what does banking fraud look like? So most people think, well, I mean, I, I actually put a picture of like a robber with a swag bag on the back yesterday, right? Because th that's what I thought most people would think banking fraud looks like. And my wife told me, you know, clearly everyone knows that banking fraud has moved online, right? So actually you have these hackers who are kind of stealing your data and running malware on your computers and kind of stealing your money that way. But what's really interesting is that, you know, this, this image of a lone hacker kind of working away in their parents' basement is probably slightly out of date. So here are some examples that I think of what shall we say, fraud establishments look like, right? So these are examples taken from the dark web. So, uh, you know, Popeye uh, selling his own branded Visa cards. Uh, and, you know, what to do, he's doing his business via ICQ and live chat. Uh, but what's really interesting is much like a gourmet restaurant advertises its provenance, oh, we source only the finest local ingredients. This guy is actually his provenance, right? So he's saying, I sell only own small and strong spinach from POS. So POS is point of sale terminals, right? And so what often happens is you get the, and so this happened to uh, Oracle who kind of deliver software for point of sale terminals. So the server that delivers updates was compromised and it actually delivered this malware to all of the terminals that connected to it. And then all of these details were then being uploaded to a central server that then gets sold by our friend Popeye. Okay, very good. Uh, so what's, what's really interesting here is that, okay, well, Uncle Sam also selling cards. Uh, if, you're a, if you're a fraudster, right, selling fake cards, how are you gonna take payment from your users, right? So you're obviously selling money, you're obviously selling cards, so you can't really take a card number. 
right? Because it might be one of your own cars that you're selling, or uh, you're, you're not sure that you're going to get the money. So everyone seems to have settled on Bitcoin, right? So they say that, oh, well, you know, Bitcoin minimum fifty dollars, and he accepts Bitcoin from a certain uh, from certain exchanges. So what's really fascinating for me is, you know, uh, that these people, you know, in order to keep transactions private, have kind of settled on a transaction mechanism that's the most public possible, right? And there's some really fascinating work on like visualizing transactions in a Bitcoin network where you can actually see some nodes that are clearly coin laundering nodes, right? Hundreds of things go in and like only a few things come out. Now, that's interesting. So this is my favorite site, so Mr. Bin. So Bin is bank identification number, right? Uh, and uh, what's really fascinating is banks are extremely secretive about having a comprehensive list of bins. So actually, if you want a free list of what bank identification number corresponds to what, you should probably go to one of these sites because they have their data more available and more readily updated than anything you can buy. Uh, uh, and uh, well, again, you know, again, these are real, real enterprises. What I love about this site is referral bonuses. Invite a friend and get five pieces for free. Uh, yeah, it's just amazing, right? So, uh, so that those three sites sold credit card details. This one sells eBay and PayPal verified. So they say, you know, it's email, AVS, uh, credit card number. Everything is verified and confirmed, all for the low, low price of 150. But you know, as as part of a startup that has growing pains where we're kind of developing technology very quickly, but when we're onboarding people, nothing's actually written down. I find it really remarkable that these guys have, you know, user guides, documentation of how to avoid uh, detection, all of this kind of stuff. And so the same site, the Stealth Buy, actually says when they sell you this account, they will also sell you the browser profile that was used to create the account. So all of the cookies are in place, the browser version is the same. Uh, they will tell you what IP address they used to create uh, these, uh, these uh, accounts. So it's pretty incredible that you know, their level of knowledge about what anti-fraud systems do are, uh, you know, is, is pretty high. And if you follow that guide, it tells you, oh, well, you know, don't link to too many other PayPal accounts, use a bank account, this and the other. So that, that's, that's pretty interesting. Uh, and then, you know, this is your standard uh, purchase. You transfer money in via Bitcoin, and then you purchase cards in blocks of five or ten, right? So you get, like, you know, ten cards for $20, pretty cheap. And you can get bank account details for pretty cheap, too, as low as $5 an account, right? Obviously, if you buy in bulk, it's cheaper. Uh, uh, and so one of the things that, that's interesting is, like, why has banking fraud moved this way, right? So in the good old days, if you wanted to open a bank account, you walked into a bank branch and you kind of showed your documents and you know uh, things like that. But actually what's happened is that all of these services have moved online, but the verification methods, there is, there is no established common verification method for digital identity, right? So you give them an email, you give them a phone number, but you know, actually no one really knows, is this email legitimate, is it not, has it just been created, uh, is it not, things like that. What doesn't also help is the huge scale of data breaches that have happened in the last few years, right? So most recently Equifax in the US, uh, if you're an American citizen, you know, I, I, would, I would be quite worried because they leak data for every single adult American, right? So your name, your social security number, your address history, whole bunch of stuff all got leaked, right? So then it becomes quite interesting, right? So what, what do you do when you receive an application and you know that potentially every detail that you got has been compromised, right? It's, it's, an, it's an interesting question. And then I think in, in the fraud industry, people talk about the fraud balloon, right? So where if you kind of have uh, an additional security technology, it kind of moves fraud elsewhere. And I'll give you an example. So this is probably the result of doing these slides at 2 a.m. last night. But uh, uh, 
but basically, what, what you have is, you know, countries in various stages of maturity in terms of introducing security technologies, right? So you will see that the USA is a bit of an outlier because they still use mag stripes, which are very easily uh, counterfeited. So if you actually look at your card, you will actually see that there's a magnetic stripe that actually contains your card number. So the machine reads that. Uh, and uh, you know, kind of says, "Oh, this is this is this card number." So those are incredibly easily counterfeited. Uh, whereas in the UK and most of uh, the rest of the world, people use things like that chips, very hard to counterfeit, and actually usually protected by a pin. Right. So what, what's fascinating is if you kind of look at the percentage breakdowns of fraud uh, in the USA versus everywhere else, 44% of fraud in the US is on counterfeit cards, right? So someone swipes your card, stores an imprint of the magnetic stripe, and then you know, uses that to create uh, uh, a card that's used somewhere else. Uh, and what's fascinating is if you look at countries that have gone, you can tell what countries have gone chip and pin, because there's almost no counterfeit fraud there. But it's not to say that there's no fraud. All of that fraud then has migrated to e-commerce transactions, where actually you can't actually give people a card number. Right? So Australia, Canada, 80% is e-commerce fraud. Uh, Britain, 70%, things like that. So, uh, so, so that's why we are where we are. Right? So it's uh, large-scale data breaches, lots of electronic commerce, no established provider of digital identity. Uh, OK, so if, if that's where we are, what can we do about it, right? So, uh, the, so this is our approach, right, to kind of looking at, uh, so looking at some aspects of banking fraud. So I'm going to talk about three, two things here, right? two main use cases. I'm going to talk about application fraud. So when you kind of come on board, are you a valid customer or not? And then I'm going to talk about transaction fraud later. And I think, you know, uh, as Mark alluded to earlier, I'm, I'm threading a very, very fine needle here, right? Like, I have to protect the confidentiality of my client's data. I have to protect my company's IP. And yet, I have to give something that's interesting, right? So um, it's not a content-free presentation. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to talk about uh, so I actually sat down and made up some data that illustrates the patterns that you will actually see in data sets. And maybe we can talk through uh, you know, what one might look at to find, to find fraud, right? So, but back to the slide at hand, right? So what, how, do, how does feature space detect application fraud? So the key thing here is actually like capturing device data, right? So what device did, these, did this application come from? Was it a desktop computer? Was it a mobile device? So mobile devices are actually uh, the biggest leak of privacy there is, right? So you can pretty much pinpoint a mobile device. So you can pinpoint a repeat uh, visit from a mobile device uh, pretty accurately, right? So whereas with desktop browsers, you know, fine. Like, you know, Dell makes thousands and thousands of computers that actually look very similar. But there are things you can do to kind of un uniquely identify a repeat visit. Uh, then you can, so then in, particularly when you're doing application fraud, you want to ingest third party data, right? So you want to ingest uh, consortium data, things like, you know, stuff that your credit report contains, you know, or where, when did I last open a bank account? How many new loans did I open recently? What's my address history? Things like that. Just to kind of establish that this person is credible and established and, you know, uh, banks and has been part of the financial system for a little while. Uh, and then, you know, you kind of munge all this data together, and then you can kind of get a prediction for, like, you know, whether this is likely to be fraud or not. So, uh, okay, so I, I wanted to be as interactive as I could. So here's my first example, right? So this is, and I'll, okay, I, I, I'll spoil the game a little bit, right, by telling you everything here is fraud, right? Uh, but the signals that, that, that you look for to kind of predict each row might be slightly different. So this is like a highly simplified version of what you might get on a banking website, right? So uh, you ask for their email, you ask for their name, their surname, and then you have like a password hint question and a password hint answer, right? So remember, this is a banking website, so you know we'll come to that later. So 
our friend Kenny Coyne, 1970. Why might you be suspicious of, of, of that application? Can any volunteers? Yeah, right. So the, the, actually, Kenny and Coin actually the, 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 has n nothing to do with the name and the surname, right? So you might be suspicious of that. Uh, okay, so so you say, okay, well, a great signal to look for is the percentage of the first name that's contained in the email, the percentage of the second name that's contained in the email. Great. Now let's look at line two. So the percentage of the first name that's contained is 100% in the email. The percentage of the second name that's contained is also 100% in the email. And yet, if I looked at it, I would be suspicious. Why? Right, it doesn't sound like a name, right? You kind of have, it kind of looks like something that's been either generated using a keyboard mash or a random, you know, random like name generator, right? And so, password hint answer, favorite book, Coconut 01, fine, right? Like you, you also look at that and you think, well, okay, maybe that, that's slightly strange. So remember, these are going in time order, right? So, so you, you get the Kenny coin first, then Plosco a second, and then so on, right? So at this point, you've only seen Coconut 01 once, right? Uh, and the password hint answer is free text. So you can't actually do like a dictionary lookup or anything like that, right? So uh, you kind of think, okay, well, you know, I would say that Coconut 01, fine, right? Looks a bit strange, but actually that particularly the surname doesn't look like, you know, a, a naturally generated surname, right? So how would you incorporate that? Like, you know, do you have like a, something that generates a gibberish score for a name, right? So what could you do? Well, you could actually say that, you know, actually how many legitimate words do you see M and Q together, right? So not that many, right? So you kind of look maybe at like, you know, concurrences and you say, well, how often does, does that happen? Okay, so you look at application three and you think, well, actually, you know, look, uh, maybe that doesn't look hugely strange, right? So that, that, that may be okay. Look at application four, that, you know, maybe the surname doesn't match, but actually that also looks okay. But you look at application five and you're getting multiple applications from the same email with totally different addresses. Right? So again, that might be something you want to look at. And you'd be like, oh, okay, well, you know, how, ma how much data am I getting for an individual email? Uh, but then if you kind of think that, that, that that's a good rule, well, if you kind of look at the last but one line, so you have Chunky Monkey 22 and Chunky Monkey 23, right? So it almost looks like someone is generating these things sequentially. So it, maybe it's not just enough to aggregate based on email address, but you probably want to have some kind of fuzzy match. And you want to say, if I'm close enough to this other email, then I want to kind of join those up and kind of do aggregate statistics on that. Uh, and then the thing that's interesting is by the time you come down to, oh, so if you look at James James's password hint answer, that again looks like gibberish, right? So how would you kind of generate things like that? Again, I don't think that actually has any vowels, right? So there's not that many English language words without any vowels in it. Uh, and then by the time you get to like Sally, Michael, and Dominic, you're actually starting to see a pattern where you have the same answer to multiple different questions, right? So your favorite book is Coconut 01, your favorite place is Coconut 01, your first pet is Coconut 01. So then actually you can link on attributes that are not the name or the link on attributes that are not identities. They're not names, not email addresses, but they could be other things, right? So hopefully that kind of gives you an idea of what kinds of things you would do if you're just looking at tabular application data, right? And I'll come to what you can do with like device data in a bit. Okay, great. So fine, we, we, can, we can do a little bit with applications. What can we do with transactions? Okay, well, great. So uh, similar story, let's, let's, let's run something here, right? So uh, transaction data, you, you usually, so with application, you get a very rich data set, but you only get one. With transactions, you don't get a very rich data set, right? But you get the entire history. So if you're kind of the bank, you get the entire history of what this person has done. So, so let's look at what transactions you'd be suspicious of here, right? So you kind of say, oh, this person bought. I mean, you can almost tell yourself a story. You kind of look at the data and you can tell yourself a story of what this person is doing, right? So they 
uh, gone to the Starbucks and they've got a coffee, they bought a newspaper, they got on the train, they had lunch, they picked up cash on the way home, maybe they picked up some groceries at night, and or oh, 20 minutes later ended up in Glasgow and withdrew 300 pounds, uh, 300 pounds in five minutes. Okay, that looks a bit strange, right? So, uh, so again, like a lot of transaction fraud detection is kind of looking at what's congruous uh, and what you know kind of fits with the recent history of the user, right? So obviously the flag of moving from London to Glasgow in 20 minutes while you know would be an amazing thing if it was possible actually is not but here's a question right so if i remove the glasgow and i said london would you still be suspicious of those two cash withdrawals you would right so yeah you you might be right because actually you just withdrew cash earlier in the evening what if i told you that all of those were withdrawn using chip and pin would you still be suspicious Right. So again, like, so, so here are the things that are, that, that are really interesting, right? Because when you kind of look at fraud examples, you can see, oh, like, I, I can see why that would be suspicious. But actually, when you have like a, you know, a billion transactions or two billion transactions coming in per year, you know, things that happen one in a million times happen very often, right? So actually, you know, there could be very legitimate reasons why someone actually wants to withdraw lots of cash in multiple chunks. Uh, and this kind of stuff happens all the time, right? So people are mostly creatures of habit, but occasionally, once a month, twice a month, they, they will actually do things that are unusual, right? Uh, and the, the difficulty of focusing entirely on the fraud examples is that you can say, ah, oh, yes, if I have two cash withdrawals in rapid succession, it's probably fraud. But then you actually look at the raw data and you say, okay, well, for every fraud that I catch using something, a simple rule like that, how many genuine transactions will I affect? And the answer turns out to be horrific, right? 150, 200, something like that. So that's not something you can use. It's a useful indicator in combination with a bunch of other signals, right? So example one. Example two, uh, great, right? So here's a person that buys Starbucks pretty much at eight o'clock every morning, except one day where at one o'clock they deposit, well, 200 euros into pokerplayer.eu, right? So again, this is something that you might want to say, well, but actually that stands out as, you know, what, what people call out of pattern behavior, right? So actually I usually transact in a certain number of places and I'm suddenly doing a large transaction somewhere that I never usually transact, right? So uh, it could be that this person, you know, gambles and usually gambles using another card, but actually, you know, he's using this one for the first time. But, you know, it, it does look a bit suspicious, right? So, you, you, so that, that's another signal that uh, is very helpful. And the network of interactions between people and merchants things, and things like that is a very rich source of uh, information and a good, good source of signals. Okay, great. So, so here's another person. Uh, you know, kind of, again, doing the same thing, buys a Starbucks, buys a newspaper, buys a train ticket, buys lunch, buys something on Google Play, and spends 300 pounds buying computer games on Steam. Uh, again, so the, one of the things that's interesting is that those two transactions at 13, in, in the 1300 mark are a typical pattern of what you will see people, do, people doing, right? So when you buy cards off the dark web, what you will do is you don't trust the, I mean, look, when you're, there's no honor among thieves as it were, right? So you kind of buy a credit card, right? And then you're not sure whether it actually works or not, whether someone's reported lost or stolen or things like that. So what you want to do is you want to take, you just want to make sure that the card is alive, right? And so you try a low value transaction where almost certainly there will be enough money for this transaction to go through. You just want to check whether the card is live, and then if it is live and the payment goes through, then you're like, oh, happy days, I'm gonna take as much money as I can from this, right? So you usually get something where people test the card to see if it's live, and uh, relatively soon after, uh, try to you know, monetize that. So 
it's not just things with users that can be strange. It's also things with merchants, right? So crazy that cats.com is an incredibly popular merchant where every second a different account shows up to spend 30 pounds. Is this, so actually, like this very repeated pattern uh, and a lack of diversity among the spent amounts probably should tip you off that Crazy Cat is actually not doing a great sale here, but probably is being attacked by you know, someone who's scripted, like they've bought a bunch of cards, and they've scripted their websites to check out 30 pounds each time, right? So that kind of thing is very indicative of someone, someone's merchant's website that's under attack. Uh, so, but here's the question, right? So where will you flag and stop this attack? The third transaction? The fifth? The tenth? Uh, where do you have enough confidence that you're in, you're in the right place? And this goes back to what Mike, Mark was talking about earlier, about having this fine-grained control between the false positives and the detection rate. Because if you have a risk appetite, uh, and you say, okay, well, I'm, I'm happy to let my customer spend money, you might go at the 10th. But if you say, well, you know, I, I really want to protect my customers, then you might go at the third, but at the risk of false positives. Uh, so this is stuff that, you know, that I talked about earlier, so I, I, I ha only have a couple of minutes. But here's something that actually adds a uh, good signal, right? So if you, it is certainly possible to put some JavaScript on a web page where you collect device level data and you collect the behavior of the person on the page, right? So does that work? Uh, yeah. So what you can do is you can say, okay, well, you know, this person, uh, you can compare what they usually do and then you can say over time, actually, this looks a lot more suspicious. The, the thing is slightly longer. But you can see that like, usually they tap on the right side of the screen, but now they're tapping on the left side. Uh, and, you know, so you, you can kind of see that the interaction between the user and this particular mobile app is different to what, what, what's usual. Uh, and so this kind of data, this behavioral data, is incredibly good at picking up bots on a website, right? So if you kind of look at the trail that a mouse leaves on a web page, uh, bots generally, well, currently anyway, don't exhibit a huge amount of diversity in their interactions with the page. So you can actually see, okay, this is a current session, but my last session looked exactly the same, right? So I'm trying to repeatedly log in, transfer money, log back out. Whereas real users have pretty different uh, behaviors. Uh, and so, again, like, so if you have the current page and all of this data, you can say, you, you can actually start to make predictions about user interactions on a web page, right? So uh, if you look at the time, it's 1.44 a.m. So this person logs in, creates a transfer, makes a payment, but actually because all of their characteristics are concordant with what they've done before, the score is very low. Like there's like three or four zeros in front of the decimal place. So now, you know, that's fine, right? So, so they do that. So now what happens? So you have a malware uh, infection on your computer that's kind of taken your computer over, is logging in and kind of transferring money. So you log in, you create a third party mandate, you transfer, uh, you, you, you transfer the money, and then the, so you get pretty high scores, right? So it's 0 0.2 rather than like having four or five decimal places. But what's really fascinating is that uh, once the malware has logged in, created the transfer, and logged back out, the real user logs in uh, and uh, checks their statement and, and makes a payment on their normal like on, on their account, transacting normally. And the model is pretty good at kind of, you know, kind of really reducing the risk threshold, saying that this person is acting in in concordance with what they have done before. The risk score is elevated, but it's nowhere near as high as it would be. So what, what's really fascinating here is that the first section is an automated set of interactions from a, from a malware bot that's actually acting on a website, and the second section is actually the user, and you get the same session, basically, so, which, which is interesting to pick up. Uh, so I'll skip that. Uh, practical concern. So, I think, you know, to Mark's point earlier, right, we get a lot of people who kind of apply and, you know, have kind of really bought into 
deep learning, and when deep learning is the hammer, everything is a nail, right? So, uh, what, what what's really interesting is the is the interaction between commercial pressures and science, right? And if you're a startup who is kind of living on VC funding, speed to market is critical, right? And you know, usually neural nets or deep neural nets, anyway, you kind of have you train them by using graduate student descent, right? You throw enough graduate students at the problem where you, you, you find an architecture that works for your, particular, uh, for your particular use case, and then you're golden, right? You can publish lots, and you know, all is good. If we did that, we would run out of cash and no longer exist, right? So the, the cycle time of engineering features and using well-known, classically understood machine learning techniques is orders of magnitude quicker, right? So we can actually deploy to our customers much, much faster than, uh, than if we kind of waited for graduate student descent to kick in. Uh, the other thing as well that's interesting is like, you know, Miriam and Mark were talking earlier about using deep learning to extract features, but they're talking about deep learning to extract features from visual images where all of the image, or all of the data that you need is just there, right? For tabular data, we've tried a little bit and we haven't really found a huge uplift, if any, over our hand-engineered features, right? So again, like this is something we're looking at, but for tabular data, uh, we're, we're not really seeing the, the, the hype being justified for deep learning. Uh, so I'll skip over this, but the only thing I will say is one of the things in fraud detection is that you're guaranteed that your test set will contain data that's different from your training set, because fraudsters are adaptive. Right, they're not going to do the same thing that your system knows how to catch. So you've got to be really sure that your, that your algorithm is going to be well behaved when you get inputs that are outside of what, what, what it knows how to handle. Uh, and then lastly, well, what do our clients want? Right? We're a commercial company. We exist and make money if our clients are happy. So one of the things that comes out time and time again in my interaction with clients is that they want to know why they're seeing an alert. Right? So it's no longer enough to just be told, this is fraud, computer says so, right? People want to know, give me an explanation, like why is it, right? Is it that uh, it's an unusually high velocity? Is it that this is a dodgy country? Is it that this is a you know, dodgy method of entering a detail? Tell me, and tell me all of them, right? I want this to be interpretable. And then when you're dealing with fraud operations teams, they really value consistency because everything that your system alerts they have to investigate, call up a customer and say, I'm going to block your card, am I not, things like that. So, they, like, so if you have an amazing system that only occasionally kind of throws up 10 times the number of alerts as usual, it's not a useful production system for them. They value consistency over a, a lot of other things. So, uh, yeah, that, that brings me to the end. I think I'm probably slightly over, but if Raul says so, I may have a couple of, uh, time for a couple of questions. A graduate student descent is probably going to be the code of the day. Uh, perfect. Um, just um, if you're interested in this topic, uh, feature space is, is hiring uh, in Cambridge, so definitely go speak to Karthik. I'm doing great. So we have time for one single question before we take a break. Come on. So, I mean, it's clear that you really need to have experts that are handcrafting these features and doing that on an ongoing basis. Yeah. Great question. Great question. So, uh, so what we're selling. So, I, I guess in in my notes of what I what I I wrote down, but I, what I didn't say is Feature Space is a real time decisions company, right? So, what we do is we deploy our software, we take data from our clients, and then in production they send us transactions as they happen, and we return a score, and you know if they want as, uh, and a score and explanation. So basically, you know. I guess you know the the thing for for us that's really interesting, and we're finding uh, what we find challenging is that you know, we kind of really live at that intersection of real time computing, machine learning, things like that. Because if we have an amazing feature, but that takes ten minutes to compute, it's useless to us, right? So we actually need to return answers 
99.99% of the time in under 100 milliseconds, right? And that actually is, is slow. So uh, for us, like that real-time aspect, that the, the knowledge of computing and the knowledge of actually what are the algorithms doing under the hood is super important. So the other thing that we've actually done is we've also got expertise from the industry. We've actually hired people who used to run fraud shops and things like that, who kind of keep their ear to the ground so that, you know, we obviously get some feedback from our clients, but we also get other feedback from them. Mm -hmm.